we want to greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to explain that we are dealing with a series of teachings uh, on the Easter weekend, dealing with what happened on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, that uh, those three days of Easter weekend. In the first message, we explained to you that the gospel is based on uh, what took place in those three days. With what, without what took place on those three days, there is no gospel. Because the gospel is based on the death burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So those three days are critical to the correct gospel that must be preached. When you omit what took place in those three days, whatever you preach is not the gospel. So the first day then we uh, looked at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to verse 4, particularly verses 3 and 4, which summarize, which uh, those two verses summarize the, uh, the gospel in a nutshell. The gospel consists of the death of Christ for our sins, his burial, to prove that he has died and we were buried with him. Our, our sinful nature was buried with him. And then his resurrection, which, uh, or, which give, gives rise to justification. We explain that. Then in the second message, we're answering the question, uh, what, what is the importance of the cross? That is the question we were answering. We did not intend to be exhaustive and we're looking at every scripture that actually mentions the word cross. We felt it was important that the word cross is mentioned in all the scriptures that we're reading. We started with uh, Romans 1, verse 17, 16, that says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, Greek or Jew, or Jew or Greek. Now, we underscored the word the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It is the power of God for salvation. Now, we went then to uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, which uh, uh, stressed that uh, the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the gospel is the power of God. The cross, the cross is the power of God. We explain that it requires power to restrain someone in sin, to keep someone captive. It also requires power to release someone from the authority of a powerful uh, person or force that is keeping that person in bondage. And we explain that uh, the gospel is the power of God to extricate someone who is in bondage to sin. And I've witnessed that. A brother that I, I knew who was in bondage to alcoholism, 
he went to where the gospel was preached, he went forward, knelt, knelt at the altar and received Christ. That was the end of it. The man was totally and completely freed from slavery to alcohol. Um, I've seen people who were slaves to sexual immorality, uh, who accepted Christ and were freed from sexual immorality. And from that time, they had a victory over sexual sin. Sin, sins. So the cross liberates someone from bondage. It is the power that liberates a person from bondage to sin. That is the importance of the cross. That is uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. Then we went to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 14 to 16 really stressing verse 16, that the cross eliminates hostilities, uh, racial, tribal, ethnic, gender-based hostilities. The cross eliminates all hostilities and it unites people who were enemies in the past, erstwhile est enemies are united by the cross. So it removes hostilities. That's important. It removes hostilities. And then the third thing that we mentioned is that the cross reconciles all things to God. That was a Colossians 1 verse 20. It reconciles all things on earth and in heaven, uh, it says, and through him, him is Christ, to reconcile all to himself all things. Or oh, through him, through Christ, he reconciles all things to himself, whether things on earth, or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So the cross brings about reconciliation. There can be no reconciliation between a holy God and sinful humanity without the cross. Those are the three things that we mentioned. We could have mentioned more, but I thought those three were sufficient. Now we're coming to the crux of the matter now. We're dealing with the importance of the cross. And then we're dealing with, uh, uh, first we dealt with the cross and the gospel. The cross and the gospel. Then we dealt with the importance of the cross. And then uh, uh, we are now dealing with the work of the cross. The work of the cross. This is the crux of the matter. And then uh, we will uh, deal with the um, negative attitudes towards the cross. Um, negative attitudes towards the cross. And then we'll deal with the issue of the resurrection. Then we shall have dealt with the Easter, the events of the Easter weekend. Now the work of the cross, there are five. Let me mention all five of them. And then we'll take two today and take the next three in the next message. Number one, it deals with sins, sins. Two, it deals with sin in singular, namely the sinful nature. Three, it deals with the world, with the world system. That's number three. Number four, it deals with Satan and Satan and the satanic forces. That's number four. And number five, it deals with our illnesses, our infirmities, those five things. And there are scriptures for each of them that takes us to the cross. 
very important. It takes us to the cross. The cross is central in dealing with all these things. We can't deal adequately with all these things without the cross. The first one, dealing with sins. What are sins? Sins are transgressions against God and his laws. Sins are uh, wrongdoings. Anything that is wrong is sin. That's the simplest definition of sin. It, you ask yourself a question, is this wrong? Can you do it publicly without blushing? If the answer no, I can't do it publicly without blushing, uh, it is wrong, then it is sin. Um, another one, sin is to stray away from the path, it's a straying away. Or sin is anything that is unrighteous, unrighteous. Anything that is unrighteous is sin. And in fact, our consciences tell, tell us when what we have done or about to do is sinful or not. Once there is something inside of us that says no, no, uh, uh, and our consciences um, charge us, then we know that that is sin. Actually, anyone who claims not to know what sin is, is not telling the truth. We all know what sin is. Now the Bible then says that the wages of sin is death. Sin is what separates us from God. Isaiah 59 and verses 1 and 2. Sin separates one from God. Isaiah 59 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So sin separates us from God. And when you die in your sins, you are separated, separated from God for eternity. The Bible says the wages of sins of sins is death. Romans 6 and verse 23. Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life uh, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Or is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So sin causes, causes enmity between me and God. God can't look at us uh, when we are sinful. The Bible says in Habakkuk, I think it's 1.13. If I'm right, Habakkuk 1 and verse 13. It says his eyes are too holy to look at sin. Uh, and it does not tolerate what is wrong. Habakkuk 1 verse 13. It says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. That's what it says. You cannot tolerate wrong. Habakkuk 1 verse 13a. What sends people to hell is sin. It does not mean that God arbitrarily looks at people or looks at people's faces and then he decides, no, I like this face, 
he must go to heaven or she must go to heaven. I don't like this one's face. She must go to hell. No, it is not capricious. He is not, he's not whimsical. He is not, uh, God does not work like that. He does not work like that. Um, what sends you, what sends me to hell are the sins which I've committed. Now there are two verses then that talk about what God does through the cross. Very critical to know through, he does it through the cross. The first one is First Peter uh, chapter one, uh, no chapter two, First Peter chapter two and verse 24. First Peter, uh, chapter 2 and verse 24. Uh, it says in that verse, He himself bore our sins in his body on the, on the tree. Okay? He himself. There's, there is a deliberate emphasis there that the work of going to the cross could not be delegated to anyone. Christ could not ask an angel to go to the cross for us. There are reasons for that. He went to the cross on behalf of human beings. That's why he had to become a human being in order to die and for his death to qualify to um, to be a payment for the sins of human beings. He had to come from a human race. He was born. Uh, he was born into the tribe of Judah, born by Mary and Joseph. That was very important. He himself, he could not delegate any human being to die on the cross for us because you one had to be sinless to die for sinful people. You can't take a sinful people, a sinful person, to die for sinful, sinful people. No. It must be a sinless person dying for sinful people. Because if it was a sinful person, that person would have to account for his own sins. So the Bible tells us that Christ had no sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15. Hebrews 4 and verse 15. The Bible tells us, tells us that Christ had no sin. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So Christ was without sin. The sinless lamb of God died for sinful humanity. So he himself, uh, the Bible says, for he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Now that tree is the tree uh, of uh, Calvary, the tree of the cross. The Amplified puts it um uh, this way it says he personally bore our sins in his own body on the tree as an altar and offered himself on it okay that we might die cease to exist exist to sin and live to righteousness so that tree is the cross that wooden tree the cross was not made of steel. It was not made of steel. It was made of uh, wood. Uh, the Good News Bible is clearer on that. Listen to the Good News. It says, Christ himself carried our sins in his body to the cross. I like that. Christ himself carried 
our sins in his body to the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. So the enigma uh, of sin, the, the, hmm, the, the riddle of sin, the issue that seems to be difficult to deal with, which is sinning, Christ dealt with it. And he dealt with it by dying on the cross for our sins. When he died on the cross, his death was a payment. It was a payment. We were guilty of the sins that we had committed and the sins which we will yet to commit. We were guilty of those sins. As a result, we needed to be sent to hell and justifiably so because we deserve to go to hell because we're sinners. Now, someone had to pray, pay the penalty for, the, for those sins and Christ did. Where did he do it? He did it on the cross. He bore our sins on the cross. So the cross deals with the issue of sin. Then the results is that we might die to sin. What does it mean to die to sin? Any person who has been truly uh, and correctly born again by the cross, that person no longer has the interest to sin. If the person was a an alcohol, alcoholic, and once he is liberated from sins, that thing that wanted alcohol was killed. So the person could go buy many bars, could even go to a bar without wanting to drink. If someone was immoral, sexually immoral, could not do away without women could not do away with men, once that person is truly and genuinely born again, that person will be liberated from that. He dies uh, to that sin. So you will see girls, uh, females, and you'll see males, and he's no longer attracted to, uh, to, to sin with them with those males or with those females. I can count many things, things that people were hooked to, uh, things that people could not do away with. Then they become born again. The cross works in their lives. It is as though, uh, it is as though it wins them. W-E-A-N, W-E. And wins, it wins them from sins. That's the cross. That's why people who used to be sinful, once they, they encounter the cross, they are liberated from their sinful behavior. So they can sing a song, it was a great day when I was born again. The sins I used to do, I do them now, no more. It was a great day when I was born again. So uh, the cross cuts, it excises that propensity, that desire, that inclination to sin. It does, it does that. It does that. It cuts that off. Uh, and that is the only thing that can deal with sins. The only thing that can deal with that tendency to sin is when you encounter the cross of Christ and your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And we will talk about something else that happens when you encounter the cross correctly. So it is an answer to the problem of sins, 
of Semik. And the people throughout the world sin. Sin knows no race, knows no ethnicity, knows no class, knows no status. Sin, sin happens. Now, when you give your life to Christ, you allow the cross uh, to cut off uh, that desire to sin. You become liberated. That's the truth. So it deals with sins. Uh, and another thing that happens is that once you confess your sins, uh, the cross may, makes it possible for God to forgive your sins because the cross is the payment for your sins. So God who is holy and God who is just. God is holy, God is just. And he can't forgive people's sins if the penalty of sin, sinning, sins has not been paid for. So by dying on the cross, Christ was paying the penalty for sins and thus opening the way for God to, uh, to be able to forgive us without compromising his justice. So it deals with sins. Then there's another verse in Colossians. Uh, I'm not sure whether it is one or two, but I think it is two. If it is not two, then it is one. Let's go to Colossians 2, verse 13. I think it's verse 13. Um, it's 14. It talks about our sins. Uh, verse th the last f five words on verse 13 is God forgave us, forgave us all our sins. He forgave us all our sins. Verse 14, he canceled the unfavorable record, the record of our sins, which is unfavorable to us. He canceled it. The Bible tells us he canceled it. Um, and this record, this record contains all our sins. So he canceled the unfavorable record of our debts with its binding rules and did away with it completely by nailing it to the cross. That was the good news, Bible. Now, if we read that verse in NIV, it says, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. I grew up in the rural areas, in the villages, in the village. In the village, there were little shops owned by Africans. Um, and sometimes these shop owners would extend a credit, would open a credit facility for the inhabitants of the village. And the inhabitants of the village would get money at the end of the month if the husband was working in Joburg and then the husband would uh, uh, send money uh, to the village. And uh, the money was cashed at the village store. So the, the owner of the uh, grocery shop, actually it was uh, a general shop where you would get everything because in the village, you must have a one-stop uh, shop where you can get everything. Now, he knew when money came because it came through him, through his shop. Now, he would then give you a facility to, to buy things on credit. 
and then when the month ends, pay with the money that has come from urban areas where their husbands are working. Now, things are very simple then in the um, in the village store. The man will write on a piece of paper all the items that you bought, and then there's a pillar, a long pillar with nails. You put a nail there, and you put your 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 debt there. And then when you come to pay, he gets the debt from the pole. He writes on it, fully paid, puts it there, he nails it. So the Bible says we've sinned against God. There's a record that lists these sins and the dates on which these sins were committed. And then Christ went to the cross to pay. And then uh, God takes the list of those sins. He nails them to the cross. He nailed them to the cross to prove that it was the cross that paid the price for those sins. Uh, those two verses are very critical. So the cross deals with sins. Uh, it provides salvation from sins, forgiveness of sins. It uh, provides the cancellation of the record of our sins, nailing them to the cross. This is where forgiveness of sins come, come, comes in. Uh, because if you, um, if you, you have committed sins, and then you go to the cross and you ask God to forgive you and your sins are forgiven, there's no guilt before, before God. There's no record of your sinning, it's nailed to the cross. So it deals adequately with sins. Then the last point we'll deal with, it deals also with sin. When we speak of sin, we are speaking of the Sin principle, sin principle. We speak of that which produces sins. There can be no sin, there can be no sins without sin. Sin gives birth to sins. Uh, sin is the mother of sins. Sin is the producer of, of sins. And sin is called by many names. It is called the atomic nature. It is called the reprobate nature. It is called the deprived, deprived nature. It is called the sinful nature. It is called the flesh. It is called the old man. It is called I. All those are used synonymously with the word sin. Now, the cross of Christ did not only deal with sins, which are the byproduct of sin, but it, dealt, it dealt with sin itself that which produces sins. The Bible tells us that a sin, uh, sin in the nature that causes us to sin, was, was crucified on the cross. It was When Christ died on the cross, the sinful nature of each one of us was crucified with him on the cross so that we might not sin, we might not, we might be liberated from that which causes us to sin compulsively, which compels us to sin. So I'll just quote one verse for now, even though there are many verses, maybe let me quote two. The first one is Romans 6, 
verses 6 and 7. Romans 6, Romans 6 and verses 6 and 7. Romans 6 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him. We know that our old self was crucified with him. We know that. When it says we know that our old self was, past tense, was crucified with him, we know that this happened on the day of crucifixion, many decades ago. Uh, that's, that, that is when it happened. That, that is when Christ took our sinful nature with him to the cross to, to nail it there. It was, it was nailed on the cross when Christ died for us. He says we know it. We know it because the Bible says so. That's how we know. So because the Bible does say that uh, this is what took place. Then what is the outcome? It says, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that, that is the outcome, so that the body of sin might be done away with. The body of sin might be, might be done away with. Um, there was anyone, anyone who had who has died, has been freed from sin. For we know that anyone who has died has been freed from sin. So once I die to self, by yielding my sinful nature to be crucified, I die to sin. I die to I die to, I die to sinning, and I'm alive to righteousness. This is important, very, very important. So the Bible then says in John chapter 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So the work of the cross, number one, is to provide forgiveness for sins we've committed. And it causes us to be disinterested in sin, and thus we die from sin. And secondly, it deals with the sinful nature. Uh, we are liberated from the sinful nature by the cross of Christ. I think we should end here. We will continue next week on this series in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat>